We've got a great video ahead about wind tunnels and how they work. First, a quick sponsor bit. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, we've been having to stay inside more for roughly the last 400 years due to one thing or another, so perhaps it's a good time to learn to do that thing you've always wanted to do. You know, illustration, creative writing, UX design, video production, graphic design. There's thousands of classes on these topics and more on Skillshare, designed and presented by experts in their field who actually talk from real life experience. It is much better than frantically Googling a topic and trying to piece it all together from jargon and nonsense. Maybe you make YouTube videos, but you want to do more work on some interesting stuff away from the bedroom webcam setup. But where to start? Well, Christopher Rhodes' classes on shooting on a budget are a great place to start and will only lead to further classes on that subject. Skillshare is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, but the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description will get a completely free trial. So click that link and dive into the next step of skilling up. And now, wind tunnels. To test and optimize the aerodynamics of their cars and components, F1 teams spend a lot of time running models in wind tunnels. So what are wind tunnels and how do they work to reveal a car's aerodynamic secrets? Now it may be a surprise to no one that a wind tunnel is a tunnel full of wind. But rather than end the video there, I thought I'd go a bit deeper because I love you all so much and you deserve it. F1 teams tend to use closed loop tunnels, meaning that the air circulates through a circuit round and round. These tend to be more efficient and better at maintaining a smooth airflow through the testing area where you put the car. The air is driven by a massive fan downstream from the testing area. It's a bit of a semantic point when you're in a closed loop, but it is better to pull or suck the air through the testing area than push or blow it, as this best maintains smooth and steady airflow around the car. But again, the air goes round and round and round, so you could argue this is just wordplay. The drive section containing the fan is a lot bigger than the testing section. The bigger you make the fan, the less fast you have to spin it in order to reach the required airflow velocity, which is more efficient, less noisy, causes less vibrations through the facilities and stirs up less turbulence in the airflow. Everything about the wind tunnel is designed to keep the airflow as smooth and predictable as possible. We're looking for laminar flow, where you can imagine the air traveling in smooth lines in the direction of the flow instead of disturbed with wibbles or messy with swirlies. I believe these are the technical terms. As such, the walls of the wind tunnel are as smooth as possible, so even the texture of their surfaces doesn't cause disturbances or vortices in the airflow. Every time the tunnel turns a corner, there are a series of turning vanes and fairings to direct the airflow and maintain its steady lines of flow. Without them, the inside flow of air would crash into the outside flow of air directed by the outer walls. This airflow would mix up, confusing its direction and cause turbulence and messy flow. After the air is accelerated through the drive section, it enters a diffuser, a widening of the tunnel. A wider tunnel means slower air, which is easier to control and keep smooth right through the testing section. The words smooth and airflow are going to lose all meaning pretty soon, I'm, I'm so sorry. Just before the testing section, the airflow passes through a settling chamber. This is a wide passage where the air must pass through veins and special honeycomb meshes of tubes that literally force it to maintain its straight laminar flow and works to iron out any remaining wrinkles. The tunnel is then contracted down to its smallest width for the testing chamber. This accelerates the air again as we still have to move the same volume of air per second, but through a smaller space. This must be done gradually so as not to introduce more turbulence into the flow by suddenly kicking some velocity into it. And now the air is in the testing chamber, rushing over our modelled car at last. At this point it should be clean, smooth and laminar. The modelled car may only be a maximum of 60% scale and the airflow must not exceed 50 metres per second which is about 180 kilometers per hour or 112 miles an hour. The car is held in place by a long vertical arm and sometimes horizontal arms at the wheels. The wheels rotate freely and the car sits on a rolling road, which runs to simulate the track moving under the car, matching the wind speed. If the road was static, not rolling, the airflow would be inaccurate as the wind would cling to the static road as it does the body of the car, instead of moving with it underneath the body of the car. Every bit of detail helps, but without the rolling road, results would be completely thrown. So now we've got the car in the testing chamber with the wind breezing over it, simulating the car running on the track. So how do we take meaningful measurements? Well, one thing we need to measure is the airflow itself. The car has been deliberately designed to cut through the air in specific ways. 
Some of the car components are designed to cut cleanly through the air without creating drag, and some of the parts, like the front wings, are designed to deliberately manipulate the air to generate downforce or redirect the air to parts of the car further downstream. So you want to check the air is doing exactly the thing you asked it to do and not detaching from surfaces too early or going rogue at the wrong moment. Some methods of measuring airflow are exactly what you see teams doing on the track at practice and test sessions, uh, like pitot tubes and flow viz. Pitot tubes measure the velocity of the air flowing past them by comparing the stagnation pressure, pressure from the force of the flowing air, against the static pressure, just the normal standing air pressure. And if you do this multiple times over a large area, as these large structures do, you can build up a picture of the shape and speed of the air over your car. Similarly, applying Flovis paint to your car will give you a visual demonstration of how the airflow forces affect the surfaces of your car. But free of the constraints of track running and with the flexibility of effectively full laboratory conditions, you can do more. Smoke visualization was an old classic. You'd introduce some light smoke or mist upstream and observe its dynamic behavior over the car using high speed, high resolution cameras. This gives you a quick and easy way of spotting behaviours of the boundary layers, the way the air sticks to the surfaces when it's close and where turbulence is introduced into the flow. Unfortunately, the problem with this method is the difficulty of introducing smoke into your airflow without disrupting the nice smooth airflow you spent a lot of time and effort ironing out. Pumping smoke even gently and carefully into the flow risks inaccuracy in your readings because you'll likely mess with the air itself. But there is a less invasive version of this called Particle Image Velocimetry, or <coughs> PIV. So in this instance, you introduce a kind of light smoke into the wind tunnel that's the same density as the air, so it hangs in the air properly. Then you let the wind tunnel circulate all the air until the smoke particles are distributed throughout the flow, so they are now just a part of the smooth laminar airflow. You can then strobe the smoky air moving over the car with laser light, and take two photographs in quick succession. Computer algorithms can then divide the images into multiple areas and track the particle movements in the time between shots and do statistical analysis to show the general air movement in that area and build up a picture of air velocity and direction through the image. Similarly, but without even the need for introducing smoke to the system and thus not having to run the wind tunnel for an hour before you even get started, is a system called laser Doppler anemometry. An anemometer is just a thing that measures wind speed. You've probably seen one. Uh, they normally look like this. A laser Doppler anemometer, though, well, that's even cleverer. This is another non invasive system, meaning you don't have to physically get into the airflow. Essentially, you split a laser light and you fire it at different angles through the airflow so the laser light crosses with itself and projects an interference pattern at a detector on the other side. Particles crossing the laser path will scatter the light such that the frequency of the light detected on the other side shifts to form a Doppler effect in proportion to the velocity of the flow. Now, that's a lot of words. I'm obviously not going to go into light frequencies and interference patterns and Doppler shifts in this video, but essentially the speed of the air particles messes with the laser light as it passes through the airflow, and this can be accurately detected and measured to discover the flow velocity. Now also the car can be fitted with surface pressure taps, lots of them. Each of these small holes will have little diagrams that will react to changes in the pressure over the surface of the model, and these feed into a strain gauge so that you can monitor the pressure acting over the whole surface of the car and build up a picture of both the character of the airflow and where forces are acting on the car. Which leads nicely to measuring the effect on the car itself. Understanding the airflow is one thing, but you need to know how the car reacts to that airflow. The car is fitted with sensors that detect its movement and the forces acting through it. So there are load sensors at various points of the car, like at both ends of the suspension arms, to measure the load acting through the suspension as the car is pushed and lifted through rolls and pitches. The cockpit of the car may house multi-axis load cells that measure forces acting in multiple directions, so you can detect the ride height, the pitch, the roll, the yaw of the car as it's run through different simulations. And speaking of simulations, let's talk about what you can control in order to simulate track related effects in the wind tunnel. And I've got to credit an excellent article by Gary Anderson in The Race, which goes into a lot of detail on this. There's a link in the description if you want a very detailed read through. So you can control the ride height at all four wheel points to simulate the car moving on its suspension. You can control the steering angle of the front wheels, obviously, as well as the angle of the front wing flaps and the DRS. You can yaw the car against the airflow as if it were moving through a corner. 
and you can even exhaust gases from the rear of the car to simulate, well, the exhaust gases. Anderson in his article details an example run whereby a car from a normal position of powering down a straight with DRS open goes through a corner. So the exhaust gases would cut off as the driver cuts the throttle, the DRS would close and the car would pitch forward to simulate the brakes being hit, the pitch and roll is adjusted with the front wheel steering and some yaw added to simulate turning through a corner, and finally they add the exhaust back in and straighten everything up to simulate getting back on the accelerator and exiting the corner. Through processes like this, they can, to various levels of fidelity, mock up a bunch of different scenarios to test how the components fare in both affecting airflow and forces across the car. The wind tunnel allows for a lot of learning and understanding of the car, and together with CFD means that parts built full scale to be used on the track are far more likely to work predictably and bring gains as expected. But wind tunnel and CFD time is being reduced, more so depending on your success. This will require even more efficient runs through the wind tunnel and clever programs to ensure the team feels confident about the accuracy of the data collected in the smaller amount of time allowed. Part of this will come from expedient use of computational flow dynamics before physical parts are even chosen to be manufactured. CFD and wind tunnel work will need to be a smart partnership. And all this as there is a growing talk of wind tunnels being phased out completely one day as more advanced CFD type software and more efficient physical systems become available. Wind tunnels are hugely expensive and a massive energy sink after all, and if one day in the coming few decades better ways make themselves available, well, perhaps we are in the twilight years of the wind tunnel.